All right. So, so what is, um, what is new about your approach to human flourishing? What, what, uh, what makes kind of your approach to human flourishing stand out? And why do you think it's so effective? You mean in energy or in general? In, in, in general, and then maybe give us some examples from energy and how, how it works and how it's been effective. Yeah, I'll start, I'll start, I think it might be helpful to start in, in energy. Okay. Uh, because so in, in energy, what you have is if energy is this huge industry, let's just say five trillion or so dollar industry, and it's got like, tons of smart people in it and talking about it. And yet really it, like, and you have this fossil fuel industry, which is most of it, it's this huge industry. And you, you have this fascinating phenomenon of, I have a virtual monopoly on the idea that fossil fuels are good. Yeah. So like a virtual monopoly. And you'd think from a market standpoint, this is insane. Right, because why isn't it that shouldn't there be a bunch of efficient market type actors who are like coming in to say, hey, hey, multi-trillion dollar industry that's under attack, that has lots of money to spend on different things. I think you're good. Like, why does nobody, why does nobody do that? And, and this is gonna point out what the gap is in energy and what the gap is in other places. And, and the reason is, is because because moral standards in a society are an incredibly powerful thing that people don't even challenge for monetary reasons. Yep. And in the realm of energy, the moral standard is, is green, unchanged nature, minimum impact. And this is a standard, as I mentioned before, is an anti-human standard. If you, to the extent you take it seriously, it's toxic. It, it literally means that the perfect planet is the one that would exist if human beings had never existed. It's it literally the only thing it can offer rationally is suicide or mass homicide or mass suicide. Yeah. Like it's really at this core, but because it's the only game in town and in part, it's the only game in town because this idea of minimum impact packages together human beings, not developing nature and dying, but then also human beings, not polluting nature. It packages those together. So people think in a vague way, okay, we have to be for this if we want nice nature to play in it and we want cleaner and clean water. It's like this, but it's very sloppy, but nevertheless, it's the only moral standard in town or it was. And so you have a whole society, multi-trillion dollar industry, everybody is towing the line in one form or another. So you have a continuum of saying fossil fuels are an unnecessary evil all the way to, oh, fossil fuels are a necessary evil, right? That's, that's kind of the, the whole continuum. And then what did I do basically? I said, well, and, and, obviously getting the fundamental insights from objectivist philosophy, I said, well, I know that in every context, you need a standard of good or a standard of value. And it's really important to think about that. And this is the worst one I've ever heard. So let's have a good one. And so, you know, Ayn Rand would call it man's life or man's life as, as, as a rational being. And, and so human flourishing is, a, I use that for, for certain reasons. It, what it captures to me that I really like and, and what, what, people get about it is it captures life at its at its best as an integrated phenomenon of material and mental. So you think of flourishing and you tend to think of, okay, the whole organism is flourishing. Or sometimes when you talk about life or survival in the objective sense, people don't get that. So that's one reason why I like uh, human flourishing uh, as a concept. Uh, but in any case, just having a pro-human standard yeah. and then having the confidence that this is right that's the kind of thing that to the extent I've had influence changes everything because it's now there's the, the monopoly got broken, at least among people have heard it because now there's this opportunity that, well, if fossil fuels are actually the best thing on balance for human flourishing, at least for a lot of people, then they can actually be good. Yeah. And even if, if they do impact nature and if they do warm climate to some extent, they can still be good. So this was just, this is just one thing, but it was the one thing of redefining a standard, of making human flourishing a standard, and then seeking knowledge and pursuing knowledge with that as a, as a standard. And in so many other fields, you can think about what if somebody had a human flourishing based standard? So say in relationships, what if, I mean, no, there's no standard in relationships now of like, oh, the goal is for you to flourish. It's just a mixture of like sacrifice and selfishness. It's just a mess. So how are people going to get clarity about that if they're not if their goal isn't to flourish? Or yep. in nutrition, 
you'd think all oh, that's scientific, but but if you think about human flourishing and nutrition, you have to think about things like yeah, taste is is a factor, like longevity, but also how you feel. So if if you're losing fat but you feel really lethargic, that can't be good. Or if you're obsessing about food all the time, that can't be good. You're not feeling guilty all the time. Or if you're craving, that can't be good. So just thinking about okay, the right diet has to be one that I'm I'm really flourishing and I have concrete standards for that. Imagine if, if people in nutrition wrote to that, most of the stuff they came up with would obviously be bad because even if people are losing fat, they're miserable all the time, they're craving, they're not flourishing. So I think in every field, this is just one aspect, yeah. but as a starting point to just have a clear standard of good and then to look for knowledge in the field as a means to that good. Because then if you have a standard, everything in the field is just generalizations about what tends to lead to that good, just like in objectivist philosophy, it's like, okay, what leads to the individual flourishing? And then there are different virtues, which are mostly ways of using your mind that, that bring you in that uh, direction. And this is true in every other field that you want every field of human action, at least like you want to flourish. And then you kind of figure out what's the cause and effect. But the first stage of that is to have the framing of the goal is to flourish. So that itself is enough to, to be hugely beneficial, but then on top of that, so that's one thing is how a standard of, of evaluation totally changes what I would call the knowledge system. Because then instead of your knowledge having no purpose, it's got human flourishing as its purpose. But then another key thing is not just standards of evaluation, they're standards of validation. How do we know things are true? How do we distinguish knowledge from non-knowledge? And this is the whole realm of, of epistemology. Yeah. I think part of what I do distinctively in that is I'm really focused on the intersection between epistemology and the acquisition of specialized knowledge. A lot of people in epistemology are focused with things like, okay, are the senses valid? And yeah. uh, even things like, how do you form a concept? And, and of course, those I need to know. But I'm really interested in say, okay, in practice, how do I figure out what's true in energy? How do I separate false like fake claims from knowledge to real claims of knowledge. What kind of...